Luther Burbank was born in Lancaster, Massachusetts on March 7, 1849, in a typical square brick farmhouse built by his father, Samuel. Luther's mother, Olive, had a strong influence on him all his life, and it was evidently from her that he inherited his love of gardening and feeling for growing things. From the time he was a very young boy, Luther was insatiably curious and wanted to know firsthand from nature herself what the rules and mysteries of life were all about. And when he came across Charles Darwin's classic work, The Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication, he realized he could actually accomplish the things he had only imagined up till then. When Luther was 19, his father died, and three years later he used his inheritance to buy a small farm. He planted a truck garden and sold vegetables at the local farmer's market. It was while tending his potatoes that Luther had a stroke of unbelievable luck. He noticed an extremely rare seed pod ripening on an early rose potato. He planted the 23 seeds that he found, and one of those plants produced a superior type of potato. This Burbank potato, as it was called, is the parent of today's Idaho russet, the most popular potato variety in the United States today. Burbank was 26, and after his success with the Burbank potato, his future vocation seemed clear. Like most ambitious young men of his time, the desire to venture west in search of one's destiny was strong in Luther. Three of his brothers had already made the trip to California in search of gold, and from their letters, California sounded like a gardener's paradise to Luther. By 1875, he could no longer contain his ambition, so he sold his farm, paid off his mortgage, sold the whole stock of the potato to a local seedsman for $150, and set out by train over the recently connected Transcontinental Railroad for the nine-day trip to San Francisco. Luther had a couple of suitcases and 10 potato tubers stuffed under his arms, a grand total of $660 in his pocket, and a singular purpose in his heart to establish himself in the profession of plant breeding in the new lands by the Pacific. He arrived in San Francisco around the 28th of October, 1875, and when he reached Santa Rosa a few days later, he immediately fell in love with the quaint little town and the surrounding countryside. So inspired was he by what he found that he wrote home his famous quote, I firmly believe from what I have seen that this is the chosen spot of all the earth as far as nature is concerned. Luther was later joined by his mother and sister who provided him with financial and emotional support. Their help allowed him to experiment with plants full time, but by 1881 Luther was becoming frustrated for he had been in California for nearly six years but was still quite unknown. Then one day a prominent Petaluma banker asked him for an orchard of 20,000 bearing prune trees by the end of that year. Other nurserymen said that it couldn't be done. Burbank, however, tackled the project and in nine months he delivered all but 500 of the trees and was proclaimed a plant wizard. As a result of this extraordinary achievement, Luther Burbank was made in California as a nurseryman. Luther used the money he earned to continue his plant experiments and by 1893, he had produced enough new hybrids to offer the most important publication of his entire career, a 52-page catalog listing over a hundred brand new hybrid plants, which he called New Creations in Fruits and Flowers. The publication immediately drew strong reaction throughout the world. Burbank's booklet was even denounced by some religious groups who claimed that only God could create a new plant. But despite the controversy, or perhaps even because of it, new creations made Burbank internationally famous. By the early 1900s, Luther was at the height of his career. Burbank plums were sold around the world, Burbank potatoes were eaten coast to coast, and his famous brilliantly white Shasta daisy introduced after 17 years of development brightened the homes of an entire nation. There was certainly something about Luther Burbank that drew a responsive chord. From local school children to the world's most famous and influential people, Luther Burbank was considered a friend. In 1915, Luther was invited to meet Henry Ford and Thomas Edison, who were on their way to the Panama Pacific Exposition in San Francisco. 
they immediately struck up a close friendship that would last the rest of their lives. By the time Luther was in his late 70s, he had been quoted and photographed as much, if not more, than any other person on earth, and was constantly being asked his opinions about every conceivable subject, ranging from current homicides to jazz music. In January 1926, Luther had been asked by a young reporter to respond to an article in Cosmopolitan magazine, wherein Henry Ford's views of reincarnation were set forth. Burbank told the reporter at some length about several aspects of his own religious beliefs, stating, Christ was an infidel of his day because he rebelled against the prevailing religions and government. I am a lover of Christ as a man and his work and all things that help humanity. But nevertheless, just as he was an infidel then, I am an infidel today. The news that Luther Burbank, the hero of Sunday schools, had declared himself an infidel flashed across the United States. Letters poured in abusing him as an atheist. More than likely, it was recalled that a letter from Burbank had been submitted in evidence by the defense at the famous monkey trial of John Scopes in Tennessee a few months earlier, and that Burbank had allegedly made disparaging remarks about William Jennings Bryan, the hero of fundamentalists. Urged by his friends to answer the many accusations, he drove to San Francisco in a pouring rain to clarify his statement. Flanked by David Starr Jordan, president of Stanford University and other supporters, he rose to speak to a crowd of over 2,500 people from the pulpit of the First Congregational Church. And in a clear, thin voice which broke the deafening silence of the crowd, he proclaimed, I love everything. I love everybody. He then proceeded to deliver a very touching, well-thought-out, intelligent sermon, and if heard with an open mind, should have quieted all his detractors. However, for once in his life, the time wasn't right, and his luck seemed to have turned. In truth, he was once again ahead of his times. Returning home, he attempted to put the controversy behind him and continued on with his experiments, including that of the spineless cactus, and ignored the thousands of letters piling up in his office. In March, he agreed to a public celebration of his 77th birthday, and by all accounts, he appeared to have a long, happy, productive life ahead of him. But as fate would have it, that was not to be. For less than a month later, Luther suffered a heart attack and drifted into eternity on April 11th, 1926. When Burbank was asked what his greatest contribution to the world of plant development was, he replied, I have said before that it was a well-meant but inaccurate thought that gave me the name of the plant wizard. I have a gift or special ability or what folks call a genius for selection, but there is nothing magical or mysterious about my methods. And what I learn to do, others can learn to do and what I have started others can finish, and what I have found out about the laws of nature in this connection can be applied by others and added to by others, if only they will waken to the possibilities that exist. I studied nature, I codified her laws, I applied them to get practical and valuable results, and I think of myself not at all as a master whose work must die with him, but as a pioneer who has mapped out certain new roads and looked down into the promised land of plant development. <laughs>